Scanning. Identity authorized. Welcome to the Secret Superhero Club Podcast Network. Through the glass, over the hedge, follow the rainbow to where my dreams begin. Shusher, shusher! I will be free. I can't knit! <laughs> All the Willoughby children ever wanted was to have a normal family. But their loving parents had no love left over for them. Hi, Mommy. They are creepy. Barnabies, will you stop? Our parents are the worst. Just think about how great our family could be if they were gone. How do you propose we discard of two insidious grown-ups? Easy. No! No, not there. There! So that's why the Willoughby children... We shall craft a dangerous adventure. ...are sending their parents on a trip to die for. Ghastly! Ruthless! <laughs> what does it say? See the world. And you know what else? No children allowed! Poor adventure! <laughs> we did it! We are free! Services? We've received reports of children without parents. Kids, we have to go. As long as they think you don't have a family, they'll keep chasing you. We have to stay together. We're gonna find a new family. Yeah, nice. We're gonna be a... My duty is to look after you guys. Yeah! All I wanted was a great family. You have a great family. They need you, and you need them. It's a candy factory. Well, life's a bit of treat without someone sweet to share it with. <laughs> what are you feeding her? After them! Annie, the gate! Welcome, everybody, to the Animation Station Podcast, episode 210. My name is Josh, and I am joined today by the writer, director, and producer of the new Netflix animated film, The Willoughbys, Mr. Chris Byrne. How you doing, Chris? Good. How you doing, Josh? Not bad. You know, I, I just realized, uh, I didn't ask you, like, is Pern the correct way to say your name? Uh, Pern works. Uh, Pern Pern. It's Pern. Uh, either... Parent, like it's like the fruit, you know, pear. Pear. That? Okay, so parent. Okay. Yeah. See, but, I knew. You know, I think I, I, Americans always say pern, so now I go by pern. So yeah, it's, that, uh, it's a yeah. like to us, it's a silent a. Yeah. So we also don't eat yeah. pears. America is like anti-pear. Well, I think uh, parts of America do. Maybe not where you're from in Oklahoma. No, it, yeah. it, it's, it, it's hard to. Any sort trees. of trees, trees blow over there. Yeah. So any sort of trees and grow. any sort of fruits and vegetables in Oklahoma is no. It's just jerky, and that's basically it. That's all. Is it chick, chicken's a fruit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, chicken like, is you, a you, fruit. Yeah. Uh, chicken's a fruit. <laughs> Egg is a vegetable. So I mean, you've got yeah. your, you know, your your daily pyramid right there. Um, <laughs> uh, so Chris, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, I, I know up, it's I know it's a hard question. It's like, yeah. so who are you? You know, who are you? I I, I we were talking. We, we got into farming pretty quick already. I mean, mm -hmm. with the Oklahoma stuff. But I, I grew up on a farm in uh, in southern Ontario. So uh, you know, I was kind of always the art kid, and um, ended up getting an animation through Sheridan College right around mid '90s. Uh, came out, was working in the industry when we were still drawing on paper. Uh, and I've been um, doing it for about 25 years now, so uh, not much else to tell. It's just sitting I'm, in the dark. Well, you you put it kind of, you make it sound you know not as you know glamorous, but I mean you're an animator, you're a story artist, character designer, writer, director, yeah. producer. So you've kind of like done it all. Like you you directed Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs too. Um, you worked on what I think is an underrated sci-fi animated film. You worked on Titan A.E. 
Uh, that was probably... my, uh, my first big feature, actually. Um, yeah, I was uh, working with Don Bluth down there in Arizona, so out in, out in, uh, out in the desert. One of the uh, first instances where we had to save Matt Damon in space. Many, yeah, and, yeah. and there's many since, and he was sleeveless too. It's, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting industry, uh, you know, having been around for long enough to watch a couple of different cycles. Uh, I mean, this, you're, you're an animation historian and fan, so like, oh, I you know, I was, uh, I was uh, working, working on Titan when, um, you know, Toy Story came out and we all kind of felt this ripple and it's this thing that um, I think even when you see it coming, you don't expect it. So, you know, it's, it, it was a real, it was a real interesting time because uh, for myself, I was, you know, learning the craft of animation and, you know, back then it was hard to find 20 people who could you know, draw and rotate characters, let alone act with them. And so the studios were really trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, grow and adapt because you had DreamWorks, they were going, I was at Fox, they were going, Disney was doing their thing. It was a great time to be a young artist because there was a lot of opportunity to, to learn. And, and it was such a culture of mentorship. Like you, you literally started out putting drawings in between other drawings. And, and as um, somebody who, came up as an artist, uh, you know, being social isn't necessarily something that we all come to naturally. And I think the hierarchy in the old days with the, with the, 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 you know, the way that we would have to work with different animators and work with assistants, like we were really, you know, collaborative in, in that sometimes uncomfortable, but, but necessary way of like learning the craft. I think some of that is gone. I think, you know, you end up with, uh, you know, people who are really good at CG animation right out of college and they yeah. can sort of in their bubble. So I, I, I do think, I mean, I don't want to sound like an old man who's like, back in the old days. Back in the old days, it was 2D animation uh, and that was all. It was, they, we didn't have shoes. We, we walked through the snow to get to the paper and then we drew on paper. Um, no, but I, I think, um, I, think it, I was really lucky to have that first step. And I think where that sort of proved out in my career is, is, is a bit of, I don't know. I think that adapting to the industry as it changes, like having those really solid base skills, uh, you know, knowing about, you know, knowing how to draw in a weird way translates into so many other opportunities within, within the business, you know, whether it's writing or design or, or storyboarding, like you can adapt into what you need to do because this communication tool allows you to talk to other artists. And so like I find like having that skill has been the thing that sort of allowed me to move from, from different job to different job. And I think, you know, when I got into the directing chair after being ahead of story for many years, um, you know, I think that, that access to the politics of being in the writer's room as a head of story, m meeting the practicality of knowing what it's like to draw a layout or knowing what it's like to, reanimate a scene 19 times or knowing what it's like to sort of go through the frustrating design process you're trying to find that piece of diamond and 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 trying to communicate with people who are helping you try to get there like all of those all of those experiences add up to i think having perspective when you're sitting in that chair yeah which is um, yeah i i did do a little bit of digging and i i, I found some stuff that you had worked on and I was like, "Oh, you worked on 16. I remember. Yeah, that was. I remember that show. And then, like, even further back, I looked and I was like, "You worked on Kablam, and like, Ka yeah. Kablam, like trying to explain what Kablam was to people today, like a kid today, but like it was like an animated like variety show. Yeah, but yeah, it, but it, that doesn't like do it justice. It's it was such a weird concept, but it worked." There, there was there was a lot of weird ones. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I worked on this show called Wayne Head. If you remember uh, Damon Wayans too, like that, yes. like where it was just like is, is like that kind of like the uh, like the that LeBron show? Do you remember like LeBron James had an animated series and they were called the LeBrons? But it was did did they have kind of like superpowers that were like like there, there's like that weird like animation thing. I think I think. And Wayne had his head could get large, and that was how he got out of trouble. It was just, but it was just. I, I, I think, like back in the '90s, like there was this boom. Like, like I, I don't know how old you are, but like the the cable thing was was new. Like mm -hmm. there was there was a moment there where 
we didn't have 24 hour, you know, cartoon channels. And then we did. And then suddenly they needed a bunch of stuff. And then the Saturday morning guys were still in the market. So there was all of this sort of, like, I think if you had an idea and you walked in and pitched like, you know, a variety show, an animated variety show for kids, like, you know, you got, here's your money, go make it. It just like, it was a crazy time. There was all sorts of stuff happening. Yeah, and, and, and you definitely yeah. you, you see that shift, like especially with Nickelodeon, because Cartoon Network wasn't a thing for a while, which a lot of people, you know, like, oh, Cartoon Network's always been a thing. No, like Cartoon Network came later. Like Nickelodeon, they did a lot of, like they had some animation stuff, but a lot of their stuff was, you know, like live action, like Hey Dude and everything. Yeah. Like, so like, and like Guts and all these cool like game shows that they had. And it's, yeah. it's one of those, like, if you look at Nickelodeon now, it's like, you don't get that. <laughs> well, I remember, like, uh, like we were talking about Titan AE. Like, that was, uh, that was the movie that um, got me kicked out of the States the first time because I was Canadian. I was down there working on a visa. And when, you know, everybody pivoted from 2D into CG, you know, a lot of those studios, you know, they fell in on themselves and they, they kind of had to. That was just was business cycle stuff. But. You know, I just had a kid. I just bought a, a house in Arizona and, you know, I had a little orange orchard in the back and, you know, this was going to last forever. And then one day it didn't. <laughs> the rug gets pulled out and you think the world's ending. And, um, you know, I went back up into Canada and that was when, you know, uh, you had, like, you know, you were saying, you, you had Nickelodeon was, was finding their voice. You had Cartoon Network in the game, PBS, NBC, ABC, CBS. They were all still doing the Saturday morning stuff. And then we had our Canadian networks. And so uh, Toronto was exploding. And so, you know, it's that thing of, of like, you know, one door closes and the window opens. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and really that was where, so I was on the trajectory to be an animator. And at the time, a lot of work was going overseas, like to Korea and India and China for animation, yeah. but all the pre-production was still done in North America. So uh, it was how I learned story and I, I, I got into story for survival. And then that's one of those things where it's like, you suddenly realize that the heartbreak of losing one career choice, which I always thought I was going to be a 2d animator led to something that I, 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 I loved more, you know, which was creating story, which is coming up with the blank page and learning about camera and sort of like the editorial process and watching how, you know, how to, build a joke from nothing like all of that sort of came from that really just i think somewhat scary time so it definitely gives a perspective on things when you watch how the world is shifting you know yeah uh so a uh, couple uh last things before we kind of get onto the willow bees um sure when you were growing up what was something that you were really into like growing up like was there like a movie or like a tv show that you were like really big into um, I mean, SCTV was huge for me. I don't know if you know that one. That was uh, it was a sketch comedy, um, but it was Second City. Lauren uh, Michaels sort of drafted a lot of the, or, yeah, Lauren, Michaels, yeah, he, like a lot of that SNL early uh, cast came in at the same time. So that was all happening at the same time. But it was Martin Short, Eugene Levy, John Candy, Dave Thomas, uh, um, uh, Joe Flaherty, all of these amazing. Dave Thomas, you know, the guy from Wendy's. Not the guy from Wendy's. Yeah, the other, yeah, Bob and Doug. You know, Rick Moranis. Uh, that all came out of SCTV. So sketch comedy was like huge when I was a kid, and I loved, I loved the Saturday morning comics. So uh, growing up on a farm, we used to get, you know, we used to get the paper delivered, mm -hmm. and so I used to cut out Calvin Hobbes and The Far Side. Like the idea of like the perfect one-panel joke to me is is still an art form that I, um, I, uh, I, I, I think is is you know. Uh, it, it, it's perfect I, to me. That is that is the apex. If you can tell a joke in one drawing, yeah. Um, and then, I, weirdly enough, like again, going, coming back to your upbringing, I remember you remember those those giant satellite dishes that yep. people used to put in the backyards. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad got one of those big satellite dishes, and then uh, early Comedy Central and stand up. So between sketch comedy and stand up, I think that sort of led me into the world that I'm in. Weirdly enough, I think those are that's the backbone. Yeah, it's one of those like yeah, I was I was really into uh, you know sketch comedy like Mad TV, and that got me into drawing. And it's like oh, interesting. Yeah. That's it's a weird, <laughs> it's a weird transition, but hey, it worked. Yeah. That's the main yeah. thing. Yeah, worked. Um, so uh, so the Willoughby's um, is Braun Animation, and if I, if what I read in the in the wonderful Netflix presser was correct, 
Um, mm-hmm. Was this your first like movie project um, outside of the U.S., like in Canada? Uh, first film, yes. First film, yeah. yeah I, I've done a lot of TV and 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 specials. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we talked projects. about sixteen. It was like purely but, Canadian, yeah. <laughs> like, so Canadian. It very, Canadian. very Canadian. <laughs> Oklahoma is like the Canada of the states, so you, you, we, we, we share that sort of, yeah, you know, yeah. self-deprecating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this was this was my first uh, first feature up in Canada, so um, it was it was definitely interesting and my first independent film, and um, you know, definitely is one of those things where you bite off more than you can chew and learn a lot as you're swallowing. I think um, during the process. Um, so, uh, we're going to talk about the Willoughby's now. Uh, so first off, thank you Netflix for, uh, allowing us to, uh, screen the film early and setting up our wonderful interview with Chris, um, <laughs> whose name is Pern, not Pern, Pern, or Pierre. Um, oh, can we call you, Pierre? Pierre's good. It gives you like a think, Pierre. I think now I can do that. Yeah. Might could, as well. Uh, Might as know, well. Finish a movie. Just start going by a different, uh, different. Pronunciation. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, each yeah. <laughs> movie you get a different pronunciation of your name. Um, yeah. But so uh, the Willoughby's is a um, animated film uh, from Netflix and Braun Animation. Um, convinced they're better off raising themselves, the Willoughby children hatch a sneaky plan to send their selfish parents on vacation. The siblings then embark on their own high flying adventure to find the true meaning of family. Both oh, family. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we have the Willoughbys. What kind of brought uh, the Willoughbys like together? Um, I mean, for me, uh, I was working on a project down in California. Here, I was on a Star Wars movie, and uh, I like how you uh, just like producer that off. You know, like, eh, yeah. I, was I was working, you know, on Star Wars. Yeah. It was, uh, it, but it was uh, it, it kind of a, through a friend of a friend of a friend, uh, Luke Carroll, who was the producer was in town and you do that LA thing where it's let's do lunch or let's have breakfast. And so met him at a diner and uh, we kind of hit it off just, just in, in the way you chat. And he uh, had optioned this book, The Willoughby's by Lois Lowry. Uh, Ricky Gervais was already attached as an exec producer. So there was a bit of momentum on it. Um, and uh, at the time, Braun was sort of beginning to uh, find their way into the live action world. So they, they sort of set themselves up as this independent studio and they were uh, they were starting to get traction on that model that they were developing. So I read the book. Uh, immediately, I think I found the dark sort of underbelly of the humor in what Lois Lowry was was talking about very funny. Mm-hmm. It was like a subversive story that was playing, you know, kind of making fun of the tropes of children's literature. So I, I came back and I said, you know, I think there's a funny movie here. Um, in my head, I wouldn't go dark. I think it should be like, you know, what if you mix Grey Gardens with Arrested Development for kids? And I just love the idea of an ensemble cast of earnest people that, you know, are kind of living in a state of denial. And so that that sort of became the seed of, of you know, uh, the comedy to, to, to build this film out. And uh, I took a stab at the first draft of the script. At the time, I wasn't slated to direct it. Um, um, Cut to like six months later. I I'd finished up my gig in the states. I'd moved back to Ontario, and um, you know they approached me and said, "Do you want to direct?" And I said, "Well, if, if you can figure out how to keep me on the farm here, um, you know, for a little while, uh, I I would love to jump into the into the pool with you guys." So we set up a little pre-production studio in London, Ontario, where I'm from, the other London, the other River London, Temple, the other London. And um, it was uh, it was pretty great because Sheridan College, which is where I went to school, is just up the road, and so it was a good place to kind of grab early production um, talent. So you know, drawers, painters, that kind of that kind of skill set. So I had a little pre-production studio with a story hub there, and then the bigger studio was over in Vancouver. And then over the course of three and a half, four years, you know, the, I spent more time over in Vancouver because that's where editorial was. But but that was sort of how the movie really began um, with that with that breakfast <laughs> all, all, all great films start over breakfast like, i think they i think most good things start over breakfast yeah, yeah. uh usually um i say that and i, I don't eat breakfast because i'm lazy That's, <laughs> it's not it's wow. not a, it's not a choice i mean it, well, sorry it is a choice thing because it's just laziness um yeah and look at the world we're in. i know but see now yeah. it's one of those like don't mm. feel you need breakfast you know like to me it's kind of where it's just like 
I could have breakfast or I mean, do we even need Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Do we need do we need time? Like Not really. I just it's I should just wander. Like it's just everything is whenever you need it and it's just, just, yeah, just it's do so what relative I, right now, you know, it's like I don't, yeah. I don't need this. Um but so for the film, uh you got a in an incredible cast of uh characters. Uh so we have uh Will Forte as Tim and guys, believe it or not, I'm going to butcher some of these names because that's how I roll. Um, <laughs> so we've got Will Forte as Tim, uh, Maya Rudolph as Nanny. Um, so this one, is it Alicia, Alisa Cara? Alessia Cara. Alessia Cara as Jane. Showing your age. And the, I, I know. The, the, I, the kids I, love her. The kids love her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, when I, I was looking at everything up and I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, so she sang the song of Moana. That's cool. So I went and I listened yeah. to that. Uh, Terry Crews as uh, Commander Melanoff. We've got Martin Short as father. Um, Jane Krakowski. 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 I was close. Yeah. That A. Yeah. That A's my Oklahoma upbringing. Like that A. It's at the <laughs> top. Um, yeah. As mother. Uh, and here we go. There's that little. There's the little hyphen things. Is it Sean or Shane? Sean. Sean. Okay. Yeah, Sean Collins. It's like a. It's like when you put like an umlaut somewhere, but it's you're not like not actually pronouncing the umlaut, and you're like, yeah. what? It's an umlaut you, but it's not. Um, as uh, I'm gonna do that with my name. Actually, that's I'll, I'll put. I'm gonna put an umlaut. Above yeah, my I should name. like put an That'll, umlaut over the yeah. O in Josh, and it's just like, yeah. how do you say that? Oh, it's Josh. Just Josh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as uh, both of the Barnaby twins, uh, and then you have mm -hmm. uh, Ricky Gervais as the cat. Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. did you have any, uh, like, say, in or any, you know, input on who was being cast for the film? Yeah, uh, a lot, actually. And I think, um, you know, quite a few of these actors I've, I've worked with before. And so I think in terms of, like, finding um, uh, the voice of a, of a character, I think, you know, casting early and, and really trying to get into a booth as early as possible to, to, to develop the writing is, is super important for what I love to do. And I think going back to that kind of improv, you know, uh, model of, I think, comedy development, it, it's it's super important, I think. To me, it's like less about the poster and more about the voice and getting time with that voice and, and, and figuring out how to make the character feel like the character um, because it's such a removed process what yeah. we do in animation. So, um, you know, for I, I work with Will on a, on a number of things. And um, to me, like, Tim has a very last man quality. Like, there was something about the way he was in the book that felt, like, analogous to sort of who Will is. Like, Will is the type of person who can do horrible things, but you still kind of love him. And not, yeah. not, I'm not judging him as a human. I'm just saying, like, if you look at MacGruber, you look at Last Man, he sort of has that ability to kind of ride that line of, like, sketchy and funny. Mm -hmm. um, so you're always kind of rooting for him. So I think Tim needed that quality. Um, when Sean, I've, I've worked with him on so many different projects. Like, any time I, 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 I make something, I always try to hire Sean because I think he's the funniest man in Canada. So, uh, and, and a really hidden gem, uh, used to be in a band Corking and Juice Pigs who was on Matt TV. So there, there's two Matt TV references, one podcast. So, um, it won't be the last. We'll come back. Don't worry, be guys. Last. We'll, we'll have more <laughs> Matt TV. But I think like finding that sort of pairing of funny people who know how to kind of harmonize with each other. I think, you know, how, I'd worked with Jane Krakowski before. She's got this amazing, ability to kind of pick up a joke and she's got like such range and you know seeing her and Kimmy Schmidt with Martin Short like that that pairing feels right you know and also she's worked with Will on 30 Rock if you've seen the episode where um you know I think I think Will was like trying to be like her or something but there was like this sort of crazy harmony between the two of them um and and the same with Maya Rudolph I mean it's like looking at like people who have worked together and sort of seeing how um, we could then sort of build that chemistry into this this project here um, was was super important. So, um, uh, so Terry was uh, with Earl and on Cloudy too as well. So like I'd, I'd worked with him, and I think the thing about that idea of like kind of a big gruff person with a soft interior that is Terry. So ultimately, like once you cast that person, then you can write for that character to, to sort of make sure that it feels authentic. Uh, and then there's sense. Uh, again, we just said it, Carl. Oh, Alessia. Alessia. Yeah, Alessia Cara. Cara. So we I'm just going to go with Cara. That's easier for me. Miss, uh, Miss Cara. Miss Cara. Uh, we saw her on, on Fallon, and she was, uh, she was uh, talking about, uh, you know, wish for the future was, I think, the bit. And it's like, you know, Fallon was like, what do you want to do in the next year? And she's like, I'd love to be a voice in animated comedy. 
And there was something so natural about her cadence and her ratatat with him. And she sort of felt funny in that unaffected way. And we always knew that James was going to be a musical character. That was something that we'd sort of decided pretty early on. And we were looking for somebody who could be both funny and organic in that song development. And um, just that one late night show uh, was, was the thing. And we reached out the next day and she said yes. And, you know, there was a little bit at the very beginning because, you know, she hadn't acted before. I think we were all a little bit nervous because, you know, you don't know how it's going to go. But she was such a natural on the microphone and just like unbelievably game to riff and to, you know, improvise and just play with the character. And um, I think ultimately, uh, you know, was the perfect casting. I think Jane's my favorite character in the movie, to be honest with you, just because it is such a, an honest sort of unaffected performance. I think she, she did amazing. Mm -hmm. and let's, let's stay with uh, Alicia and Jane because we have uh... – there's something that kind of goes throughout the movie, which I was really liking, how Jane is kind of like working on this song throughout yeah. <laughs> the course of the film. Um, yep. And the, the, the I Choose song. And then we get that payoff at the end. Uh, yeah. I thought that was great. Like, so you had talked about uh, that was something that you guys said you wanted to make Jane a musical character. Um, yeah. How like how far in advance like was this, was it like you know first meeting and like guys we want her to sing this song? Yeah, I mean, I mean initially I was just using I was using a, like just temp songs in 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 that part of the film. This idea of organically threading it throughout the entire movie um, actually brought us into the composer. So one of the things that we had to do fairly early on because. I'm not a musician was like, how do we, how do we build this? Like, how do you actually physically get all the pieces together so that this pays off at the end in four years? Um, I'd worked with Mark Mullersbaugh on a couple of different projects and, you know, he was, he's one of those people that I, I just find him a, a mad genius and he knows how to kind of build character and he, he never overplays a joke. He always knows how to find the tone. Mm -hmm. So earlier than what would be normal, I think for animation, I went down and, and pitched the movie to Mark. When he said yes, the, like literally probably two weeks after that, it was like, okay, so what we need is to figure out what the score is. We need that theme so that we can build everything else around it, all the writing, all the... So in a room, he came up with this do-do-do-do, which became the foundation for everything. And without that, like, do-do-do-do, I don't know how we would have been able to figure it out. And, and that was such an interesting thing to watch, you know, that little idea form, uh, you know, from him travel over to, you know, uh, a number of different musicians who were helping us, you know, kind of get something off the ground. And then when Alessia got her hands on it, her team took it and made it into this amazing kind of final product. And it, it, as somebody who, lives in the world of drawing I've, I've, I've never seen that happen before so that was probably one of the most special things in this experience of making this movie is watching you know the birth of a song and sort of see how that happens but um it was really cool that was really cool uh so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll kind of transition into the music there so yeah you, you had mark mother's bra uh, mother's bra so you can say that he kind of like whipped it uh into shape um, bad. I'm sorry. Everybody. Uh, uh, bad. I, I, I had that written down from last night, and I was like, I shouldn't do that. That's a, that's a, it's a terrible. Bad no, I'm thing. glad you did. I'm really like, glad you it's did. Like a, it's not hey. even it's not even a dad joke. That's like a you know like your friend's dad joke. Like that's not even a good one. I think the sad thing is most people probably don't get it because you know you have to be a child of the '80s to really kind of <laughs> kind of. Mark was talking about this. It's like how he's got fans who know him from Yo Gabba Gabba and fans who know him from, you know, the uh, the Wes Anderson movies. Mm -hmm. And like people don't even realize that he's this that, incredible visual artist that, that he used to wear a cool only red hat. hat. And then he used to sell out stadiums and yeah. you know wear weird hazmat suits and you know crazy sunglasses and and uh, animate uh, mutant potatoes. It's 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 crazy. He's uh, he's got so many lines. Man. So, uh, so, so you worked with uh, Mark before. Um, yeah. How important was uh, the music uh, while you uh, for this movie uh, in your in your opinion? I mean, I think uh, ultimately the film is two films. So very early on, we had this idea that it's going to be a sitcom meets a movie, 
And I wanted to, uh, you know, track that across all of our different, you know, ingredients, uh, from color to, to sound to, to music. So when I went and pitched the film to Mark, talked about this idea of like, they're almost being two orchestras, like a, um, a, a very uh, limited chamber orchestra that feels kind of homemade and, if anything, a little bit um, loungy, like like stuck smaller. Like so, it, so it feels like it's it fills up the house. Mm-hmm. And then as the world opens, as the kids break the seal of, of of you know their bubble, and as they step out into the world, we we elevate that into the 120 piece orchestra and it becomes a movie. But the themes that we established at the very beginning carry through to the end. And, um, you know, one of the things that sort of felt like a no brainer was like, if you look at what Mark was able to do with say, um, Royal Tannenbaums, like this idea of like taking a, a dark story, but always finding optimism and humor in it was, was very important to me. So, um, from how we dealt with the textures to how we dealt with the designs, to how we dealt with the color, I always wanted the movie to play towards the optimism, the hope. Um, so while mom and dad might be the, the baddies of the film, mother and father, uh, I always love the idea that they are scored for love. They are, they are scored as a love story. And Mark got really excited about this idea that, you know, um, they're almost like children themselves. And it's almost like they never had their rebellion. They, they were kind of stuck in this home. And, 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 you know, in that way that you see, uh, you know, some tragic figures that have never been allowed to sort of, you know, grow up. I think that's sort of the underpinning of empathy for those characters. So I love the idea that they that they had this Guy Lombardo, Benny Goodman sort of just got back from the war rebellion going on. But, you know, they were being interrupted by their children. So they were kind of like teenagers rebelling against their own kids, um, which is funny. So like like the the music was really part of crafting that tone, I think, and getting that that idea to come forward. Uh, Mark really early on got this idea of it's, it should be a harpsichord based band. And um, you know, I, at like, the time, like most bands in, in, in 2020, it's just like, how about the harpsichord? I think, I think they're hard to move around. So I think like back in the old days when people didn't travel so much, you could set up a harpsichord in New York and that would be your thing, right? You'd be the harpsichord guy. Yeah. His, his so, next uh, film, it's, uh, it's going to be all theremins. It's going to be great. It's, it's gonna, all it's, theremins. It's all yeah. theremins. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so we'll, we'll kind of transition into the characters. So the characters, especially the Willoughby siblings, they all have a very different look to everybody else in this film. So can yeah. you kind of tell us a little bit about, um, you know, character designs and everything like that? Well, that, uh, was a, that was a weird way to be like, just tell me everything about that. And, you know, so, tell me, <laughs> tell me yeah, everything. Uh, How did you draw? How work? First, first there was a pencil. We found the pencil. We shot it. Um, you guys know who Craig Kelman is, right? Yes. You know who Craig Kelman is? He's a kind of a cartoon legend. He's uh, I've worked with him on a few movies, and um, Kyle McQueen, my production designer, was really adamant that I think you know if we could cast the right character designer, you know, then a lot of the work falls into place. So reached out to Craig. He said yes, and um, again, it's sort of like the, those moments of providence where like the world suddenly seems like it gets easy. So. Craig's ability to tell a story in a single design is is almost un, unmatched I think, in, in, in the business. And when he sort of responded to the material, his idea was like a, all the Willoughby's are starved. They're they're almost like mummified in in under the umbrella of their legacy. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that, you know, it's not that they can't go out, it's that they've stopped going out. That's where the Grey Gardens reference sort of come comes into play, that documentary. So the idea is that they're very emaciated very sort of um you know i think um stuck and and even things like tim short pants uh, i love the idea that that's the only pair of trousers he's ever had yeah. and he's sort of like if you, if you cut to two months before the movie starts he had shot up six inches and i think the idea that he's sort of like awkward in his body is really something that was there early on in all of Craig's designs. Um, we were looking at like um, uh, John Cleese and Faulty Towers and that kind of idea of him, like Tim trying to be a grown up, but he's got a kid's body. So that sort of ability to sort of have those big shapes was really in, ingrained in, in all those choices. Uh, Jane having long hair, the idea was, you know, she's this lyrical character. And while Tim represents sort of the past, Jane looks it's towards the future. The future. Yeah. And so, so the design, we wanted to have something that had a lot of shape and overlap. And, and, and 
the story there is that James never had a haircut. And like this, this idea that, you know, again, it, it, these little symbols that sort of tell you where the neglect is in, in this family, I think uh, were very helpful uh, with, with, with the twins. Um, they were based on Danny from the shining. Um, they got those little mushroom heads and, you know, that kind of came from this notion that, you know, just twins are inherently creepy. And I, I probably shouldn't say that so much because I'm not a twin. So I don't know if I can make fun of twins, but uh, there's something really, I think, funny about them being sort of the, um, you know, a bit like the overstaring binary things that are, you know, kind of costly watching, but never really in the shot. Yeah. Um, so like with, with the mythology of, of these kids, the idea is that they're sort of stuck in this house. They're stuck under a name, Willoughby, which is like, you know, being a Rockefeller or a Trump or whatever. It's sort of like this idea that you're, you're, you're serving this family mission, but the family's kind of lost the mission. The, the family's sort of atrophied and, it, and, and, and it's time for change. And so we always wanted the, the designs to kind of represent that. When they collide with the real world or the real world in our movie, uh, everything that comes into their house is, is in contrast to that. So uh, Nanny represents love. And so this idea of her having this full shape, she's literally like a heart. Yeah, I did, I did and like she when walks we first see her, like the shadow does make that nice yeah. heart over the children. I was like, yeah, nice, good touch. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go there, you got to lean all the way in, I think, you know, and, and I think this idea of her representing, um, you know, uh, just new thought, like she's got new colors. And, and one of the things that really was interesting was to play with camera. So, you know, we would shoot the Willoughby's in certain ways that would, you know, um, they don't really have shoulders. So like close ups, you have to kind of get your camera back. And that kind of forced us into almost like a 70s style camera. So a bit like All in the Family or, you know, um, Jefferson's or Cheers, like that kind of idea that you don't really get like super close on the character. You're always kind of staying a little bit back. Um, also, Harold and Maude is a huge influence on, on this film. So like that idea of like, like wide cameras with a lot of just opportunity for performance was, was really important. And then when Nanny comes into the world, she fills up that camera. So now your camera's got to go even wider. But what happened is now we could sort of introduce more close-ups and that sort of plays into this idea of, of nanny connecting with the kids and she's really the first character in the movie who actively listens mm -hmm. who listens to the other characters in the world and so the camera starts to respond to that so the, so all of that sort of came from design uh commander melanoff is literally like a tempurpedic mattress with arms and so the world that he lives in is in harmony to the Willoughby's. So the Willoughby's world is very rich and kind of organic and there's lots of stuff on the walls and the kids are sort of like starving in this world of, of stuff. But everything is from the past and everything is an artifact. And you want to, I want to get the idea that there's like, like it is a museum, not a home. Whereas Melanoff's place is stark and it sort of feels empty and it feels very um, industrial as they approach it. But when you look inside, there's all of this sort of you know, fun stuff on conveyor belts. And so this idea that Melanoff as a character is, you know, playing on the trope of, you know, Daddy Warbucks or Willy Wonka, where he's sort of gruff on the outside, but you scratch the surface and there's a kind person underneath. Like, so the world is sort of representing that. So all those icons, all those metaphors came, uh, like, through the writing influenced by the design. And, and, and that back and forth was really important to us. Um, yeah. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Do you know uh, everything? Yeah, that, that, that's everything <laughs> I wanted. Right now. Bye, everybody. Uh, no, uh, like what you were talking about with the wide shots, um, I, I did like that because whenever we are in the Willoughby's home, it, it's it's pretty much kind of like almost the same color palette. You get that you get you get that purplish, orange, pink color with their hair, and then everything else is kind of like brown and kind of muted. And then when they're yeah. taking uh, little baby Ruth out into the world. That's when we start seeing all these rainbows, like everything, and and that's where we get a lot of these wide shots. One of my favorite is like there's there's that shot of them walking along that rainbow wall. Yeah. That may be one of my favorite shots because I'm just like you just see all this different color, um, and like it's the first time in the movie that we're seeing all of this different color with these with these kids, like when they're out in yeah. the outside world. Um, how how? I mean, sorry, go ahead. Oh no! Go ahead. Go. Ahead. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say like how uh, how important was that for you guys to uh, you know put all of this color in the outside world, like showing them basically like to me it was like this is what you're missing in the outside world. Yeah, 
I mean, ultimately, one of the, one of the themes that uh, you know, it, it, and in no way political, it was it was it was sort of this ingrained thing in the, in the book was this idea that you can't really build a wall to keep ideas out. Ideas always find a way through. Um, and one of the um, you know, in terms of like grounding motivation for what the story needs to do, this idea of like the kids being stuck in their in their world, but not really understanding how to unstick themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, as we as we translate that into color, we wanted to telegraph that to the audience. So inside the Willoughby house, it's very autumnal. It's very, um, you know, fall like so a lot of oranges, a lot of browns, a lot of kind of, um, you know, kind of darker tones and shadows, because we wanted the audience to feel like the kids need to get out of this place. Yeah. Like, the, like there's, a, there's, it's necessary. It's necessary that they escape. And so then the, the torture of the movie is that instead of running away, like normal kids do, they trick their parents into running away. And so, they, so the, the stakes of act two are really about, will they eventually get out of this house? I think in, in a subliminal subtext way, that's sort of running through the film. And ultimately what we wanted was this notion that the world outside is calling to them, and Tim is afraid of it. Jane is attracted to it, and the twins are curious in 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 their binary way. So for Jane, the rainbow represents the future, which is a metaphor going back to the tropes of Wizard of Oz. This idea of like somewhere over the rainbow, my dreams will come true. And I think she's never seen that movie, but she sort of, in in her own kind of uh, evolutionary pattern, has come up with the idea that that this represents uh, hope. And I think um, this idea of multicolored world is is uh, is something that we just lent into. So as the film sort of gets, as the kids get closer to the right path, they are rewarded with more color. And then as the film goes into Act Three, and they they do what makes logical sense, which is you know try to correct their mistake. As they get closer to going back into being a normal family with their normal parents, we pull color out of the movie. And so you end up in a very, you almost go from autumn to winter and they don't really get the spring until they finish that journey and sort of have that closure. And so um, ultimately that mood ring of color is tracking that overarching story. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, no, I, unfortunately, uh, the, it's, uh, you know, confession time. I have not read the Willoughby's. So this was my, this was my first uh, instance with, uh, with good, the Willoughby's. Good news. We made a movie. Exactly. Don't I don't have to. But I, I, I had two Audible Sorry, credits, well. so I went ahead and downloaded it off of Audible. So I did that. Yeah. Um, so what it was, what's it like you know, developing a film off of a book? Like what type of process is that? Like how much stuff do you have to add to kind of fill in holes? How much stuff do you need to remove from the book? Uh, to put it in, make it feature feature length. Like, how does that work? I've never. That's it's one of the things. Like, we've had people on before, and I've never asked them. So, how do you know what to cut and what to add? Like, I've never, I've never had to do that before. It's. I mean, I think it. There's no formula and there's no math to it. I think a lot of it is, uh, at least from my process, it's it's trial and error, and it's that it's that um, back to stand up. It's that idea of like, without the call and response. You, you don't get an hour of material without bombing, yeah. you know, like six months and, and figuring out which jokes stick. So um, like it was a very organic process. There were things that were obvious. So there's, there's things that work in a book in a literary way due to the, the consumption. You're reading a book and you can sort of go on wandering tangents mm -hmm. and books don't necessarily need to resolve. I don't think in a way that, movies when you ask an audience to sit there for 90 minutes you, you kind of owe them an ending that is a little bit more i think defined and and the fact that also we were shifting from the book was making fun of children's literature and i wanted to make fun of children's films and so one of the things you'll notice is that there's three endings in the movie and yeah. we kind of do the disney ending we do the the independent Canadian, you know, tragic film ending, and then we do the sitcom ending, which is sort of like or, you know, at the also, end of every episode. Of, or yeah. what, like the the Canadian film tragic ending is is the beginning of a Disney movie nine times out of ten. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's how you can tell. That's how you can tell. Like if, if you're yeah. ever watching like uh, the beginning of a Disney movie and like somebody dies at the beginning, just know that there's probably a Canadian prequel, you know, to kind of go before it. Nine hundred two and all, right? Exactly. <laughs> 
the grassy. Um, I think um, like so the, the process was really um, uh, iterative. So you know in the the book there's a whole tangent where you pick up um, uh, Melanoff's backstory, and the book follows Melanoff's backstory and it eventually winds back around to Switzerland where the kids have to end their their movie. Um, but we couldn't devote the amount of time that the book sort of gave to Melanoff for our film. There is a little Easter egg though. There is a whole stop motion scene that we animated that actually tells Melanoff's backstory. And we ended up having to cut it for time. But if you watch on the TV screens and stuff, the kids are watching is like it, the cartoon in there? the cartoon is this stop motion film. And um, Netflix is going to release it uncut after the film's out. Okay. So that's a little something to, to look forward to. But like stuff like those kinds of choices, um, you know, you have to kind of go through the, I just, whatever you, the normal process of, I, I call it a normal process. It's probably not normal in any other entertainment cycle, but for animation, we just screen every three, four months and you're constantly challenging the material. And I really think that, that there's something in that 85, 90 minute format that's, that's kind of specific to the art form. Um, Cause a two hour movie gives you more time to talk about something. And in a TV series, if you're doing 11 minutes or 22 minutes, like the ask for the audience is a lot, it's a, it's a lot lighter. So yeah. you can move a little quicker and you can be a little bit, um, that you can you can build something around a joke, whereas I think that eighty five minute format you have you, you you have to really challenge the material. Like, is this pushing the story forward? Because we don't have a lot of time, but we're asking the audience to sit there for long enough that we have to constantly be be challenging them and giving them you know make it worth their while. So uh, like things like the parent thread, um, we had a lot of the movie that was um, their story. And then I think the third screening, it was uh, it was one of those things where the tone sort of felt mean, and their their joke felt didn't feel funny anymore. And it was one of the things that I knew was funny. It just wasn't it wasn't hitting an audience funny, and it was because we gave them too much time. And so we had to sort of restructure that. So that pushed us. So I, I, these little things kind of happen along the way as you're building your entertainment value. Um, what I would do is after, after every screening, I'd reread the book. And then that way, I would sort of, sort of put it back in my head. And I would sort of try to hang on to the, to the nuggets of the book that I felt were valuable for the foundation of what Lois Lowry had sort of provided us. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, you, you go through the process of listening to the audience and you push away from the book. And then you read the book and you, you kind of just, it's that push and pull. That, that to me was, was sort of how we had to go through it. So, um, uh, as, as we kind of uh, wrap up here, um, there, the, you, you guys do a lot of, you know, kind of like running gags in the film. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of my favorites is the, um, whenever there's a car pile up, like, yeah. I like, especially <laughs> the end one where I like everything piles up at the, at the, the orphanage <laughs> like place. And then that one just like slowly pulls out, turns a blinker <laughs> on and just honks. Like my favorite. That, that was, was the that, best. That was that dick. That guy, that that person who just—it's obvious, guy. Why? Yeah, I was just, like that guy. I was uh, just like, <laughs> from from coming from Oklahoma to California, I sit there and be like, that is one hundred. That's a Californian. That is one hundred percent a Californian. My only difference was like they didn't, you know, stop like you know twenty car lengths behind because that's another thing that Californians do that drives me insane. <laughs> Um, like when they're, you know, when they're driving on the road, they'll be like right up on your bumper. But then when they're like kind of stopped, yeah. they'll take like, you know, four car lengths back. Cause they're like, you never know what could happen. Uh, there might be a gun. There, might be, there, there always be might be. Um, <laughs> but like, do you have any, I, any certain gags or anything that, you know, you, you really liked, uh, in this film? Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I, I think that's where I think, you know, for, 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 uh, for me as a filmmaker it was where I could put in some of the, the love letters to the, to the influences. So like all those car accidents, that's Harold Amad. Like every time she gets in a the car, there's a car accident, but they never deal with it. They never, I, I always thought it was like so hilarious how they never talk about what just happened, you know? And I, and I think that that was this, this idea that anytime a Willoughby steps into, into, into traffic, there's an accident and nobody talks about it. That to me is just, it just feels rich in that sort of, um, like just base comedy thing. Um, you know, there's a, there's a deliverance joke in there, you yeah. know, how do we identify, how do we identify the bad part of town in the movie? Like, um, you know, that, uh, 
is, 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 you know, a cartoon character of, of a world. It's, uh, it, it just, to me, like those kinds of nods give you um, just a little bit of that sort of levity as you go through it. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, like when Tim's talking about Evil Nanny, he wiggles his he finger does, like yeah. Red Rock is shining. Because yeah, I mean, like those Nanny, things. Yeah. Evil, like these, uh, like I just think that stuff is, uh, is important to kind of layer in. Um, but it, what always felt funny to me, and this might not be funny to anybody else, is that these kids don't know any of these references. They, they, they're like completely like Mowgli coming out of the woods and they don't, they don't get any of these things. So even like the over the rainbow thing, um, early on, like when we were riffing on Jane's song, we were talking about that earlier, is like, she's singing over the rainbow, but she's never seen that movie. So she's off by just a bit. Like that seems funny to me. And, um, like we just tried to do that throughout the whole film and just try to find those references without them knowing it's all these things like, you know, um, you know, running gags of like, uh, when something bad happens, everybody laughs. I think that that's the sitcom thing, you know, and that kind of, that kind of, you know, sound off storytelling that I think hopefully people find familiar, but they don't necessarily need to know the reference point to get the joke. Um, that, that feels fun to me. Yeah. Um, so uh, is is the book narrated by a cat? No, no, okay, no so that, that was not, that was all. That's all for the film. And, and for us, that for me, that that gave it tone. So I mean, having that one character that could look at the audience and say, "This is this is really messed up. This is really weird. Come with me. I'll show you. You know, a really weird story." I, I think allowed us to kind of keep what I was hoping to keep from the book, which is that subversive tone and that kind of that kind of darker stuff. So having a character look at you and go, this is screwed up, helps you get off the hook for what you're trying to do. Um, I also think it, it led to a lot of the choices on design, like textures, this idea like it's a cat's point of view. So the world feels handmade and everything sort of feels a little bit heightened. You know, that, that kind of comes from that perspective. And it's also, I think, you know, it was a choice to lean into what Ricky does best, which is comment on the stupid things that humans do. Yeah. And I think that um, allowed us to sort of, you know, use his voice in a way that sort of felt organic to the story. Yeah, and be sure and stay tuned for after the credits. You get a, you do get a little bit more Ricky Gervais. Yeah, um, that, that's, uh, that, that was my favorite joke in the entire run of recording. <laughs> that, it's, it's one of those, like, I, that's what I do. Now. Like, whenever I go, whenever I see a movie, like, I stay through to the credits just because it's kind of like, you know, just like, a, oh, all these people worked on this. You know, I'm going to, you know, at least look at their names. I may not know who they are, but I'm going to look at their names. Uh, and then yeah. and then you always get, you usually sometimes get nuggets. I say you always, and then it's you usually, and then it's you sometimes. This time you you literally get nuggets. You get, you get yes, you do nuggets. get nuggets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <geez>. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I thought it was great. Um, but, yes, uh, The Willoughby's uh, on Netflix now, so it is available today. So go watch it. Um, and Chris, uh, if anybody, you know, wants to follow you social media wise, like, where, how can, where can they follow you? Oh, I don't do a lot of social media. I'm, I'm, well, that was, old... that was, I, I'm on, that was a pointless I'm on question Facebook's. then. I, I'm on the Facebooks. I'm on the, um, on the Instagrams. Uh, just look me up, Chris Perrin, or you can email me. Remember, I, I bet there, you could guess. There's, there's an E. <laughs> Pierre. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and we'll put, you know, we'll put your social media links and we'll put a link to uh, the Willoughby's in the show notes. So all you have to do is, you know, click on it and you can watch the film. Um, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Josh L. Kane. You can find the podcast on Instagram at Animation Station Podcast, on Twitter at Animate Podcast. All of our episodes are available iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and on our website, animationstationpodcast.com. Again, thank you so much to Netflix for uh, allowing us to watch the Willoughby's early and uh, allowing us to meet Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, for the Animation Station Podcast, I'm Josh. I'm Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Pierre. Pierre. P- Chris, Sorry, uh, I missed Chris the bit. It's, it's it's fun. We, we, I, I, I'm an animation. We should workshop this and, and give me four years and we'll, we'll <laughs> and nail we'll that. It. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. So for the Animation okay. Station podcast, I'm Josh. And I'm Chris Pierre. And remember, with great responsibility comes mustache. Great. It's great mustache. Oh, I messed up. I even messed up the bit. Bye, everybody. No, it's okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>